Okay, so what I thought I would do, like Krisha said, is just go over some things that we are seeing or have seen here in the past, oh, you know, several weeks. And some of the pictures I have actually came from around the region. And I thought I would actually start by making this a little interactive. And this photo here just came in this morning and it came in from Putnam County. And the homeowner has it growing um, kind of in a shaded area as you can see it's kind of part sun part shade in that photo and it's growing I believe on the north side of a, a shed and they wanted to know what is it and we're looking at the lower growing broader leaf plant not that elongated leaf we're looking at the, the smaller rounder leaves and if anybody knows what that is go ahead and either put it in the chat or just unmute your mic and tell us what you think that is Anyone? Okay, so that is liverwort. And I have to admit that at first when I saw that, it, it came in from our ag business specialist up in Putnam County. And when it came in, I first thought, you know, it was uh, some kind of fern. And it certainly is in that family. It is related to a fern. But I wanted to be a little more specific than that. So I sent it out to three horticulture specialists around the state. And our horticulture specialist down in St. Genevieve County, I um, in the southeast part of the state, was able to identify that as liverwort. And uh, liverwort is a flowerless spore producing plant with the spores produced in small capsules. And it is found in shaded moist areas. And again, this was found in Putnam County. So if you uh, see this plant growing in a shaded area in your lawn or an area on your property, that's what it is, it is liverwort. Let's do another one. This one might be a little bit easier. Anybody know what that is? It's a spiderwort, isn't it, Jennifer? It is, Cheryl. That is a spiderwort. And spiderwort is a pretty common uh, plant grown in shade gardens. So you're going to find it in a shade garden or a moist area. And a lot of our gardeners do grow spiderwort. So it's a pretty common plant, and it's a native plant. You might also find it as you're taking a hike in the woods. In May, maybe early June, you'll find this in a wooded area. But again, a lot of our gardeners are using this plant in their shade gardens. And the last plant for ID. Every gardener's favorite plant, huh? What is this one? This grows in your lawn. It's the uh, dreaded ground ivy or creeping charlie. So if you have a lawn, you've, you've probably dealt with this. This grows in shade, it grows in sun. It's very difficult to get rid of. If you're going to try to spray it, you need a broadleaf herbicide. Usually one that contains triclopyr is what you should use. Again, it's a little hard to control. So make sure you get a, a herbicide recommended for it, something containing triclopyr. Okay, let's move on now to some issues that we have seen around the region. We're going to start with herbicide damage. And those of you that have been on our Wednesday home horticulture town halls, you have seen this and heard this presentation. I think it's important to do for those that have not seen this yet. And then uh, we will move on to some other things. So we're going to look at herbicide damage to plants. And I think it's important to first talk about modes of action. How is the herbicide damage occurring on our garden plants? Around the state of Missouri, we have seen herbicide damage on garden plants by spray drift, where it has drifted from a nearby field. We have seen herbicide damage to garden plants from runoff. And I'll just tell you, I talked to a homeowner in Sullivan County about three weeks ago, and he had put on weed and feed. And we know that you know, May and early part of June, we were getting some, uh, some rain, actually quite a bit of rain, especially in the southern part of the state. They were getting a lot of rain in, in May. But we've had rain here, and the gentleman put on weed and feed, and shortly after he put on the weed and feed, I mean, it had rained, and his garden plants, his vegetable plants, started showing herbicide symptoms. And we figured out it was from putting on that weed and feed, which contained a broadleaf herbicide in it. 
And then uh, liquid herbicides that have been sprayed have drift or have ran off after rains into desirable plantings. And I'm going to show you photos of these. And then I talked to a lady in Macon County that we figured out her plants must have been affected by contaminated compost. So let's um, actually get into some of these photos and we'll take a look. These photos um, are from seven years ago. Um, I am going to show you some recent photos, but this is a good photo to show you uh, of a soybean field. This is just east of Lancaster. It's about two miles east of Lancaster. The photo on the left shows you a, a field. That was a soybean field. And then they had this little buffer strip here of grass. And then there was the garden. And the ag business specialist and I from Schuyler County went to check out this garden. And just about everything in the garden was affected by herbicide spray drift. And you see the green beans there on the right. And then these were the pepper plants. Notice the white spots. That is very common when you have drift. The herbicide drifts and the particles settle on the leaves and you have the white spotting. These were the onions. That was her cabbage. There's the corn. And that's the, the last photos I have of this particular garden. Notice the spotting is on, you know, the various different species. It's not hoe specific. It was over just about everything in that garden. And the homeowner tilled it all under and, you know, did not harvest anything. They were just done with it. And uh, I mean, pretty much the whole garden was destroyed by the herbicide drift. So they um, just said, forget it and pulled things out and tilled it under. Okay, the next slide here. I got this in about three weeks ago. These photos came from Macon County and the homeowner lives in town, right in the town of Macon. They are not surrounded by any fields and they weren't sure how this could have happened to their tomato plants, but we got to talking and the homeowner had gotten some compost from her son who uh, raises cattle in Macon County and here, someone on the farm had used pasture guard. The pasture guard contains triclopyr, the same active ingredient I told you to put on your creeping Charlie because creeping Charlie is a hard to control uh, broadleaf weed in our yard. Well, we found out that the cattle had grazed after the field or the area was treated and it got into the manure and got into the compost. And she put the compost in her tubs where she was growing the tomatoes and the tomatoes had taken it in. We're pretty sure this is herbicide damage caused from triclopyr, one of the active ingredients in pasture guard. So we've looked at two ways now, drift and contaminated compost. And now let's look at runoff. So these elderberry plants came from Texas County. That's actually my home county. I originally from Mountain Grove. My parents still live down there. And I was down there about three weeks ago and these elderberry plants were very distorted and gnarled looking and, and just really bad. And even the flowers looked, looked bad. Well, come to find out the landowner had sprayed weeds around his lagoon with a broadleaf herbicide and the elderberry planting was just down from that lagoon in an area nearby. And South Missouri received a lot of rain this spring and the herbicide ran into the elderberry planting because this is right in the heart of the Ozarks. There are no crop fields around and you know we knew the herbicide had ran off from where he sprayed because of the rain they were receiving. Okay and then I don't know where these photos came from. In extension we share a lot of photos around the state with each other um, but these came from uh, somewhere in Missouri and it does look like that's a wheat field in the background. So maybe this came from somewhere in central or north Missouri. Um, but that is an oak tree. And notice the bare ground around that oak tree. Well, to get that bare ground, somebody uh, sprayed herbicide around that because they thought it'd be a good idea to get rid of all the weeds and have a nice area around that tree with no weeds. And uh, well, look what happened. The oak tree uh, has herbicide damage. Look at the leaves, all the, you know, gnarled looking, distorted leaves. So that's classic of uh, herbicide uptake uh, from a person using herbicides around that tree. So that is something you never want to do. We recommend hand pulling your weeds and then applying a thick layer of mulch around the trees. Never put the mulch up on the trunk, keep the mulch away from the trunk, um, but do use um, 
use mulch instead of herbicides. So a lesson learned there. All right, the next thing I wanna talk about is fasciation. And these pictures came into me, today's Thursday, I believe they came into me on Monday. And these are from right here in Adair County. And this was um, on a master gardener's prairie. Wanted to know, hey, what's wrong with these? These are kind of weird looking flowers. But I actually see, see this every year. I've seen it in cone flower. I've seen this in a lot of different flowers. And it is, uh, if you get to reading about it, it tells you it's a, like a genetic mutation occurs and causes that to happen. You know, it's out in her prairie, you know, no big deal. She's just going to leave it. She thinks it's kind of neat, but we do see this. I see this a lot. I um, mean, every year I see a few flowers that look like this. Now I want to show you a sweet potato. This came in uh, several years ago from a home gardener in Adair County. And they brought this in the extension office and wanted to know what is going on with my sweet potatoes. Well, this is what fasciation looks like in sweet potatoes. And again, it's a genetic mutation. Regardless of what plant it's occurring in, it is, has to do with genetic mutation. But that's what it would look like in sweet potato. And then one day, uh, this has been a few years ago, I was out in the uh, garden and grow garden behind the Adair County Extension Center. And there were some master gardeners with me. It was during garden grow time. And some of the asparagus looked very wide. The stems look wide and had some little stems coming off like you see in this picture. And they wanted to know what is going on with this asparagus. And it had fasciation. So it can happen on a wide variety of plants. You know, you can see this on flowers and on vegetable plants. So yeah, just a heads up on that. Uh, that is something you might see uh, as we go later into the summer. Okay, moving on. This just happened, again, about three weeks ago. There's a lot of things going on about three weeks ago with plants. This is my own moonflower plant. So I went to a local nursery here in Adair County, and it's a nursery grower that I've worked with for many years, and they do a really good job. But, you know, sometimes these growers, or gardeners, get aphids, and they try to get them under control. But I bought this moonflower plant from the nursery, knowing it had aphids, knowing that they'd had an aphid problem that they were trying to get under control. I noticed aphids under the leaves. It was a pretty bad infestation of aphids. And I had it on my deck. And this is moonflower. Moonflower smells wonderful. So if you want a, a plant, has wonderful evening scent from about 8 p.m. to about 8 a.m., moonflower is a good choice. And it does have to have a trellis to grow on. So I have it growing on my deck um, to where it can grow on the railings of the deck. And I pulled it away from the railing at the time to take this photo. But I want you to notice the spotting on it. And what I did was I used an insecticide labeled for aphids. And the insecticide is labeled organic, organic garden insect killer. And I want you to look at that middle slide of the active ingredients. It says rosemary oil, peppermint oil, thyme oil, clove oil, and other ingredients. Okay, so those are all herbs. And so it's made up of herb oil, okay? And then I want you to see the, the slide on the left. It says, do not use if the temperatures are expected to be over 85 degrees and then spray in early morning or in the evening when it is cooler and do not apply in midday sunlight as temporary leaf burn may occur. Okay, so I followed the label directions. I'll, I'll tell you, I didn't read the label directions because just through the years, I have experience to know that you don't apply pesticides in the middle of the day. So before the sake of giving a program, I wanted you to see what the label said. And uh, so I sprayed the plant at about 8 p.m. It was cooler uh, than the daytime. And by the next evening, 24 hours later, it had these spots all over it. So I knew right away it was a phytotoxicity. And what I assume happened is the uh, chemical, because it was an oil, it was still on there the next day and it reacted with the sunlight and it caused this uh, reaction to occur called phytotoxicity. And I have seen this in other plants in the past. I went and looked at a commercial tomato field several years ago and they had used a sulfur product and their tomato plants were burned up and spotted like this. Actually, this isn't bad. I took this photo just before our town hall on Wednesday morning of this week. This is two weeks. The photo you're seeing here is two weeks after the reaction occurred. So it was actually worse than this um, the next day. So 
But anyway, I just know that even though our products say to do it in cooler temperatures and in the evening, the next day, if the chemical is still on there, which it probably will be, you can have a reaction just like you see in this picture. So what should I have done instead? Well, I thought it was okay to use that product and obviously not. So what I probably should have done, I could have done is just sprayed it off with a water hose. Just a stream of water will get aphids off most of your plants. So that is what I would recommend that during the summer months is just use a water hose and try to spray them off. Anyway, this plant's coming back and it should be just fun. And I'm hoping for some nice pretty blooms on it later on with nice strong scent. I wanna show you the phytotoxicity in cucumbers. So this is what it would look like on a cucumber. And that's kind of what it looked like on the tomato plants I saw in a commercial field. So just be aware that uh, that can happen. That is why we always tell you to spray in the evening or in the morning, but even so you, it can still happen. Okay, we're gonna move on to some insects. And I'll start with the cucumber beetles. I am seeing cucumber beetles and I'm seeing these in my home plantings of cucumbers. I have not seen them here at the extension office yet, but everybody growing cucumbers and squash needs to be aware that they are out there or may be out there. Okay, what I have seen are the striped cucumber beetles. And the photo on the left shows you their damage. That is exactly what I'm seeing in my home planting. They are not quite that bad, but they, they're out there and they're making that kind of a defeating damage on the leaves. Now, my cucumbers are flowering, so I don't wanna be spraying insecticide while vine crops are flowering because if you're a gardener, you know that you have to have bees or pollinators to pollinate your vine crops, uh, whether it's squash or watermelon, cantaloupe, honeydew, cucumbers, you need pollinators. So we don't want to be killing those off. And just because something's organic doesn't mean that it won't harm the pollinators because it will. Organic products are meant to kill insects and so they will kill your pollinators. So I can't use an organic insecticide on that. So what I'm doing at home and it's, it takes some time. And I go out there, well, my kids are working with their show lambs and you know, I kind of want to be involved in that, but I also don't want cucumber beetles eating at my plants. So I am picking off cucumber beetles and smashing them. So that is what we would recommend if you have the time to do it, uh, just pick off the beetles and smash them or some gardeners tell me they're putting them in soapy water, okay? But you don't want to spray and kill your pollinators. Otherwise you may not have cucumbers or you may have distorted looking cucumbers or squash because of the pollination disorder. Okay, so just a heads up on that. Okay, every year we have calls or emails about wilting squash plants. Why does my zucchini look beautiful one day and three days later it's dead? You know, maybe it looks good and a day later it's wilting. Why? What's going on? Well, it's usually one of two things. It's usually bacterial wilt or it is squash vine borer damage. And these photos here were taken uh, here at the Adair County Extension Center in our garden and grow garden. And all the photos you're seeing here are from squash vine borer. How do I know that? Well, what I recommend or what we did is look at the base of the plant. Go right down at ground level, look at the base of the plant. Look for a hole in the stem. The hole will be about the size of a pencil eraser. If you see a hole and you see sawdust around the plant, you have squash vine borer. And when the plants are really bad, I pull them out. If they're really bad, they're wilted, we pull them out. If the plant looks like the plant on the left where it's still fairly decent looking or it's still growing, I will take a piece of wire or it could be a coat hanger and I will gently poke it into the hole and try to puncture the worm that is in there. So you can do that. You can gently puncture the worm. If the plant is very wilted and too far gone, pull them out and throw them in your trash. Do not leave them laying in the garden, okay? You've got to get rid of them. Throw them in a dumpster or a trash pile or really wrap them up in a sack and throw them out because they will hatch out into an adult moth or moth-like um, insect, and then it will start the cycle again. So we wanna get rid of these larvae. 
The squash vine borer larva is a white or cream colored worm and they start out small but as they feed they grow okay and so usually when I find them they're already a half an inch to an inch long and I have found some that are already an inch long at times I have found up to as many as seven worms per stem which is a lot and those plants you're not able to save so how do I know I've had seven well, I take a plant that's really affected and I just split it all open, split open that stem, and then they're all in there and uh, they feed on the tissue. As you can see, they're eating away that tissue. And when they eat it away, the water cannot be taken up through the plant. And so that's why the plant wilts. And here at the extension office, through the years, we've had this problem, but I kind of know in advance it's going to happen. So I do take powdered seven and I put it around the base of the squash plants and only the base, never around the leaves or on the leaves, never near the flowers. I only put it on the ground because I don't wanna kill the pollinators. And even so, I'm probably still taking a chance of killing pollinators even right there at the base. So if you do it, try to only get the base because that's where the bore is going to bore into. There's no need to put insecticide on the leaves or near the flowers. Okay, now backing up, there's another thing that could be causing the plant to wilt and that is, that is called bacterial wilt and that is spread by insects. That is spread by squash bugs or it could be carried by the cucumber beetles. There is no cure for bacterial wilt. You have to control the insects. So we recommend picking off as many of these insects as you can and putting them in a bucket of soapy water or just smash them. I step on them. Get rid of the insects and that will help cut back on the bacterial wilt that you may have. But I, here at the extension office, it's been squash vine borer more so than bacterial wilt. Any questions about those issues? Hey, Jennifer. So I just had a question about Japanese beetles. Do we see them affecting garden plants? I do not see them on garden plants. Um, they tend to like ornamentals. Their favorite seems to be roses and other flowering ornamentals. I have never had a problem with them in the vegetable garden. I have trapped Japanese beetles uh, for about six years here at the extension office and I hang the trap near the garden, near the vegetable garden. But in my garden here, we have some native plants, we have some non-natives, uh, like daylilies, but we have native plants too, because I need those native plants to try to draw in the bees for the vegetable plants. And I have never seen Japanese beetles on the vegetable plants. Honestly, I'll, I've never seen Japanese beetles in the extension garden, even with all those ornamentals in there. They are not feeding on any of the plants I have. And I trapped as many as 55 in one week, 55 beetles in one week I trapped uh, in a trap uh, hanging right by the garden. So that kind of tells me maybe they don't like vegetable plants and maybe they don't like native plants either. Another reason to use native plants. I'll tell you, they love roses. Their favorite is roses. And I've had people tell me that Japanese beetles will devour their roses overnight. I have a sister in Springfield, Missouri, and she has reported that hundreds of them will come in and just devour her roses overnight if not controlled. Seven does kill Japanese beetles and they will feed on other ornamentals. It seems like it's mainly the ornamentals. I mean, if I'm trapping 55 a week here and they're not on any of my plants, that kind of tells me maybe they don't like the plants that I have here, which are the vegetables and the natives. Now, trapping is not something you want to do for Japanese beetles, okay, as a homeowner, because trapping releases a pheromone that actually attracts them, okay, so you, don't, you really don't want to attract them to your garden, so we don't recommend trapping for homeowners. I was only trapping to see if they were in the area, and we found out, yes, they were, but they were never a major problem here in the Kirksville area, and I've had people at... Uh, Truman and uh, I had a master gardener that lived on the south end of town trap for me too. And they would trap some, but just not in large numbers. Now in central and southern Missouri, they would trap thousands of these beetles a week during the trapping time. So they're not 
a huge problem here in Northeast Missouri, thank goodness. Okay, on this screen here, I have trap crops. And that is something we encourage mainly market gardeners and commercial growers to do. Uh, Hubbard squash is a good one for planting along the border of a commercial field and the squash bugs and squash vine boars, they love that plant and they will flock to the Hubbard squash instead of your other desirable squash you're trying to grow. And then when they're on that squash, you actually spray the Hubbard to get rid of them. And so you use it as a trap crop, not as an edible crop. So you can spray them and therefore you're not going to have to spray your other squash because they really like that. They'll, they'll be attracted to that Hubbard. And we've had some home gardeners that have tried it through the years, but Hubbard squash gets really big. So it's not ideal for a small garden. Okay, BT is on here. I want to talk about that. So BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, is in the form of Dipel, or for the home gardener, we find it in as the brand name Dipel. The company Fertilo makes Dipel, which is BT, and that is good for caterpillars. So you could put that on your coal crops, coal crops being broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprouts, and Dye pail will kill the worms um, as they're feeding on the leaves of those crops. And we all know that cabbage butterfly and cabbage loopers, the worms love to eat coal crops. And dye pail works good. And dye pail is on the list of organic products for certified organic uh, growers. I also have neem. Some of our gardeners uh, have used neem uh, and report uh, pretty good results with that also. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Let's talk about stink bugs. Kind of a hot, drier summer, we will have stink bug problems. And these are local pictures or from around the region. And you can see the kind of range in degrees of severity. Notice the one in the center. I mean, that's just, that's really bad. That picture may be from 2012, the drought of 2012. So that year we were seeing squirrels eating tomatoes and insects on tomatoes. That was their water source. You know, when everything was dried up and brown, critters and insects were turning to tomatoes and fruits and vegetables for a source of moisture. And they can get that from tomatoes. And just wanted you to see the difference here and, and know that if your tomatoes look like this, likely it is stink bug. And look around your plants and, you know, on your leaves for the stink bugs and smash them or put them in a bucket of soapy water and drown them. This is early blight and I'm not seeing it right now, but we do see it most years, especially in a wetter spring and summer. And it will start on the lower end of the tomato plant. It starts as yellowing of the lower leaves. So it doesn't just turn brown and look like this quickly. It will start as yellowing of the lower leaves. I usually get the calls and questions when we're at this point right here, but this problem started long before, you know, what you see here. So yellowing of the lower leaves comes first, and then you will start seeing large brown irregular blotches on the yellowing leaves. And that, that will be early blight. Okay, most likely early blight. And we recommend that gardeners and growers have some kind of mulch down uh, for a home garden situation. Mm -hmm. We recommend straw mulch. So you need to put, you know, two, three, four inches of straw mulch around all your tomato plants. Make sure they're staked and caged. Take off any lower leaves that are on the ground or touching the ground. And the fungicide you would want to use would be something containing chlorothalonil, which is the brand for the home gardener, it is Dacanil, comes in a red bottle, and you can buy ready to use or concentrate. And we recommend spraying the lower half of the plant, especially if it's been a rainy, humid season. On the, the bottom photo shows you the large brown or black blotches. They often have concentric rings in them, and that's how I can determine them or distinguish them from another problem called septoria leaf spot. In a really bad case, you might have infections on your tomato fruits. I usually don't see that, but it can happen. So here you see that dacanil is listed. Chlorothalonil is the active ingredient. 
Bravo is listed there because that is the product that our commercial growers will use. They can buy that in large quantities. It too contains chlorothalonil, but on the home gardener level, uh, daconil is the product you can find at garden centers. Jennifer? Yes. What is wrong with your tomato plants when on a plant the leaves start curling? Oh, we're going to get to that. Okay. It's, it's in this. It's called leaf roll. Let's look at Septoria leaf spot right now. So this is really common too. And you can tell, I can tell the difference because with Septoria leaf spot, you have lots of little brown spots. You still have yellowing of the leaves on the lower part of the plant. So that is the same as early blight, yellowing on the lower end of the plant. But the spots will be more numerous and they will be smaller versus the larger blotches with early blight. And as a home gardener, if you can't figure out which one you have, that's okay because the care for both diseases is the same. You know, they need to be strawed with mulch. They need to be staked or caged. Lower leaves need to be taken off and daconil is the recommended product for both diseases. So it's okay if you can't figure out which one you have because recommendation for control is the same. Okay, moving on to some physiological problems of tomatoes. These are problems that are not caused by a fungus. It's not a disease. It's a physiological problem. And I've got a list here, but we're going to just jump right in here and take a look at each one. This is called blossom end rot. And years ago, um, people, when I first started this job, people thought blossom end rot only occurred in tomatoes. And then they were kind of surprised to learn, well, it can happen in peppers. And it can happen not in, just in bell peppers, but it can happen in jalapeno peppers. And then we learned it can happen in yellow squash and zucchini squash. So yes, blossom end rot can happen, you know, even in watermelon. So it can happen on a wide variety of garden vegetable plants. Okay. And the problem is that the plant is not taking in enough calcium. The calcium is usually there in the soil. Our soils really are not calcium deficient. But this calcium has to be taken in by water and often it gets hot and it gets dry and some gardeners rely just on the rain or they are watering well and then they take a vacation and they're gone for a week or longer and nobody is watering their plants and then they come back and they start watering again. Well during that time that they were gone or during if you're just relying on rain the time between rains the ground gets dry and calcium has to be taken up by water. So if the ground is dry, the calcium is sitting there in the soil. And what happens with the vegetable fruits, the fruit of the plant, is that the cells collapse in the bottom end of the plant. And so it's been compared to like osteoporosis in humans. If we have a lack of calcium, that's something we may get. So this is caused from the breakdown of cells due to the lack of calcium. So what you have to do as a grower or gardener is just keep your plants consistently watered. So if it's, it doesn't matter if it's a pepper, a tomato, a watermelon, zucchini, keep those plants well watered. And I can't stress enough the importance of using mulch because straw mulch will hold in moisture better than just, you know, just having the ground bare. And already this season, I, I haven't seen blossom end rot yet, but I've had pictures come in from gardeners around the region that have issues and they have no straw at all around their plants. And they would have less issues if they would put straw around their plants. There's a lot of reasons why we would use straw, not just for moisture control, but for disease prevention, for weed control. So if you're on this call or this program and, and you don't have straw around your plants, we highly encourage you to get straw around your plants and that will help alleviate some of these problems. Okay, moving on. So cat facing is something we see in tomatoes. A cold weather at the time of blossom set intensifies the deformities. Cat facing is usually most common in the large fruited beef steak type tomatoes. And I would imagine most of you have seen uh, this happen with some of the big beef steak type tomatoes or some of the heirloom tomatoes. And again, it's just a physiological disorder and you can uh, try to cut that out and eat what is, is edible there. Cracking, that is something we see just about every year. And again, it, it's kind of like blossom end rot where you go uh, for a period of time with no water and then the plant takes in lots of water at one time 
and it's like filling up a water balloon. You get the water balloon so full of water that it just bursts on you. So it's kind of like the tomato doing the same thing. It takes in a lot of water at one time because it's gone several days or a week with no water, takes a lot of water in, can't hold all that moisture, and so it splits. And uh, we just call that cracking. A lot of cherry tomato varieties are, are prone to doing that. Okay, Carisha, this is what you were referring to, and this is called leaf roll. And we are seeing this around the state of Missouri, not just in the Northeast region, but there have been reports of this statewide. And it is more common in some varieties than other varieties. It is not something to worry about, uh, or at least not worry about much. It is uh, caused by excessive moisture and nitrogen or heat or drought, severe pruning, root damage, and transplant shock. So those are all things that can cause it. And again, we've had a lot of, we have not necessarily had a lot of rainfall, but Southern Missouri has had a lot of rain. Uh, we have had some heat and humidity, and we've actually had some days where it was, you know, kind of mild, kind of nice. And then the temperature shot up to like 90 degrees or close to that with a lot of humidity. And so going from a 20 degree difference, let's say 70s to, to near 90 with high humidity, that's a little bit of a shock to the plant. And so they will curl. So that, that it's actually pretty normal to see some of these varieties curl their leaves. So we call it leaf roll and uh, pretty common. We see it every year in certain varieties, but nothing really to worry about as long as you're doing other cultural practices like mulching and watering your plants regularly. This is sun scald. We will see this as we go into August and into September. This tends to happen on the tomato fruits that are on the outer part of the plant where there's not a lot of foliage. So it's really important to have good foliage cover. And I tell home gardeners, pruning isn't necessary. So we do have commercial growers that will prune their tomato plants, but in the home garden, having a green, bushy, leafy tomato plant is just fine because it helps prevent sun scald. So if you see this as we go into the later part of summer, that's what it is. It's, it's kind of like baked tomato. So uh, one of our horticulture specialists, Patrick Byers, down in the southern part of the state, uh, he and I have kind of joked at times about how we see baked apples. You know, people really do bake apples, but on the tree, we can actually find baked apples on the outer part of the tree where the sun has been really hot and beating down on the apples. The side facing the sun will be baked, basically baked apple. And that's what's happening with these tomatoes. It's just too hot. The sun is beating on these tomatoes and it's causing the color not to form real good. So having good foliage cover as well as some shading, if you can provide a shade cloth, some gardeners in a small garden can provide shade. So that is helpful. This photo came out of Kansas City, I believe a few years ago, and the client wanted to know what is wrong with my tomato plants. And that is called root primordia. And tomatoes are one of the only garden plants that you can plant deeper than the root ball. So I always tell you, plant your plant at the, the level it was in the pod or at the level of the root ball. Well, with tomatoes, you can actually plant higher because tomato plants will form roots on their stems. And that's what this is. You're just looking at roots that have formed on the stem. So we call it root primordia. Here we have solar injury on blackberry. This can also happen on raspberries. And this is uh, also pretty common in a hot summer. It can be hot and humid or hot and dry. And we will see this problem. And it too is just from a lack of foliage on the outer part of the plant and just that hot sun uh, beating down on those berries and it doesn't allow the berry to fill out. And each one of those little individual parts is called a druplet. So some of those druplets just don't fill out due to the heat and the sun. Again, I call it solar injury on blackberry or raspberry. The next thing we're gonna look at here is spotted wing drosophila. This has been a problem since 2013 in the United States. This insect first came in, I believe, in to the state of Washington on infected uh, plant material and has since spread throughout the entire country. And it is a fruit fly. So there are different species of drosophila. This one's called a spotted wing because the male has spots on his wings. The female has a very sharp pointed ova depositor, which you see there at the top, and she pierces that into ripening fruit and lays eggs. Those eggs hatch into larvae, and you can see on the sides here, the larvae are circled, 
and they will feed on your ripening fruit. And you may have one or you may have five or six little larvae in fruit. So how do you know you have this? Okay, because it's raspberry season. We're picking raspberries. We just wrapped up picking strawberries. We're going into blueberry. Actually, the blueberry farm here in Adair County is open for business. So how might you know you have Drosophila? Well, the easiest way to tell is when you're picking berries and you pick one and juice runs down your arm, you probably have Drosophila. So every time that I've had a juicy berry run juice down my hand and arm, I've opened it up and there's been Drosophila in it. If I pick a fairly firm berry and juice does not run down my arm, then uh, it, good chances are there are no Drosophila in it. Spotted wing Drosophila likes to lay eggs in ripening fruit. So right at harvest time, they want to lay eggs in that ripening fruit and those eggs hatch and the, it's the larvae that are feeding away at your fruit. But again, a good indicator is juice running down your arm and very soft berries. If the berry feels firm, you're probably good. Okay, codling moth. This is a problem in apples. And when people will refer to wormy apples, like I have wormy apples, it's the codling moth that they're referring to. In the adult stage, it is a moth, like you see in the left picture. And then the larva is a worm that feeds in the center of the apple. That moth lays eggs, and then the eggs hatch, and they burrow right into the center, feeding in the center of the apple. And then you may pick that apple, and you take a bite, and there's a worm in it. Or you get to the center, and there, there's the worm. You can actually see the entry where the worm entered. So look for holes, and you'll see where the worm entered. And often there is frass inside the apple, and frass is just a nice name for bug poop. But we often see that inside apples that have been affected by codling moth. And I'm not going to get into the spray schedule, but I'll just tell you, if you want perfect um, apples and perfect fruit, you do need to use a spray schedule for fungicides and insecticides, starting uh, sometimes starting before they even bloom with dormant sprays. But especially after petal fall, you never want to spray during bloom because you don't want to affect your pollinators. But right after petal fall, you want to start with some of the sprays if you want to have nice, perfect looking uh, fruit. This is cedar apple rust, and these are the galls that will get on cedar trees. They contain millions of spores that then blow in the wind and the rain onto crab apples and apple trees. Right now, we are seeing this on apple trees that have not been sprayed. So if you have a crab apple or apple in your yard and it looks like this, this is called cedar apple rust, and it is too late to spray for this disease. And no, it's not going to kill your tree. It might defoliate a little bit, but a tree can lose 75% of its leaves and still be just fine. It just needs to retain about 25 to photosynthesize. This is black rotting grapes. I am starting to see this. I did not spray the grapes here at the extension office, and I do see this in some of the grape clusters here, and it is too late to control this. And if you want to have, again, this is like the fruit trees, if you want to have nice fruit, you need to spray. Now, my problem was, and why I didn't get it done, is we, when it needed to be sprayed, it just kept raining. Like all the garden, we're all in the same situation, southern Missouri, northern Missouri. It's hard to keep up with the sprays with the rain. It's like it rains and then you spray and then it rains again. And, you know, so it is kind of hard to get those sprays on when it rains a lot. And once it quit raining, I mean, we've had a little break in the rain, but the disease already formed. So when they say that once you already see the symptoms, it's a little too late. But just wanted to give you a heads up, we are seeing this. Peach leaf curl, we saw this in May, uh, usually early to mid-May is when we see this, and it causes a pinkish uh, blisters on the peach leaves. And at this point in time, it is too late to spray. Don't waste money buying chemicals to spray at this point in time. You want to spray peach trees during the dormant season, once in November, usually around Thanksgiving time, and then again in early March in North Missouri. You probably want to spray in February in Southern Missouri, but you want to spray the peach trees. You want to have good coverage on the trunk and the branches, and you want to do it twice in the fall and in early spring while the tree is still dormant. Now, you see some dark sunken areas on this peach tree. Those are called cankers. And you hear us uh, talk about cankers in various programs. And that's what a canker is on a peach tree. And you definitely want to get fung fungicide down into that canker uh, to kill any fungus that might be down in there. 
Moving on to some ornamental things that we see. Here are galls. We see this year after year, and there's different types of galls. This is a hickory horn gall, and then the middle one is gouty oak gall, and then the one in the leaf is some kind of leaf gall. The photo on the left here at the top is maple bladder gall. The, the middle one's a hackberry called nipple gall, and then here's the hickory horn gall all caused by parasitic wasp mites or midges and control is really difficult and we recommend just just kind of ignoring it not doing anything emerald ash borer is killing millions has killed millions of trees in our country and in southern canada and this was imported into our country and it is caused by the larva of the uh, adult emerald ash borer here which is metallic green Notice the emerald ash borer adult is not very big in comparison to a penny. The larva will feed on the tree, the inside, and make galleries like you see in the lower left. And on the outside of the tree, they are making D-shaped holes, like a capital D with one straight side and then a rounded side. I'm seeing dead ash trees in our northeast Missouri counties, Adair, Schuyler, Scotland, Clark, up along the Iowa border. But Emerald ash borer has been reported in many Missouri counties. Here is sap sucker woodpecker damage. Sometimes people think this is caused by a borer, a borer being a, a worm, caterpillar. This is from the sap sucker woodpecker. If you have a lot of holes in lines, horizontal lines, vertical lines, uh, this is woodpecker. This is not borer. So just a heads up on that. We see this in a, a variety of trees. This is a white pine tree. They do tend to like the pine trees. I think not only are they after the insects, but they will drink resin from the tree. This is a bagworm. People through the years have called saying they have bagworms. And when they tell me they have these webs on the outer parts of their tree, and what can they do for these bagworms on the outer edges of the tree? Well, when we get to talking, they're referring to fall webworm. So fall webworm actually makes webbing on the outside of the trees. And that happens in the fall. And a true bagworm is what you see in this picture. So the bagworm is typically one to two inches in length. It's kind of diamond shaped. The actual bagworm is this moth looking insect you see in the photo. And then in the bag is the actual worm. And the worm feeds on the foliage of plants. They like both deciduous and evergreen, but they tend to like evergreen over deciduous plants. So just kind of heads up on that and, and monitor your plants for bagworms, particularly in late May and early to mid June. And then I have a few things listed that you can use to spray for bagworms. So this is a true bagworm, not the webbing you see on trees in the fall. This is scale insect. And sometimes I get calls from people that say that there's this white crusty stuff on my woody plants and it, it is scale. And look how bad this plant is. If your shrub is this bad, you need to cut it down or pull it out and start over. This is a, a euonymus plant. So euonymus plants are likely to get euonymus scale. You know, just a heads up on, on that. If you see white things on your woody plants, that's probably what it is. Just want to point out oak wilt. Oak wilt is something that kills oak trees very, very quickly, typically pin oak trees. And I've seen several pin oak trees in the Kirksville area die in recent years. It's caused by fungus, but it's spread by tree companies pruning trees and moving from client to client without cleaning their tools. So if you have somebody come trim your trees, make sure that they are using clean tools. You know, you might ask them, do you sanitize your tools, you know, between clients and ask them if they will do that because they are spreading oak wilt. Okay, and the last thing, that you should know about is southwest injury it, it is a type of winter injury and i get many calls through the year and, and through the years i've had calls on this where people say the top of my tree is dying and my tree is only eight years old or it's only five years old and it's losing branches and then when they send me photos um, this is what i see i actually took these photos at the veterans memorial here in kirksville and this tree is gone but notice a split so southwest injury typically occurs on the southwest side of the tree. It is caused from the freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw action uh, during the winter months. And it splits that tree open, damages the inside of the tree where it can't take in moisture. And then the tree starts dying and the tree needs to be removed. 
So if you plant a tree, whether it be fruit tree or ornamental, for the first few years of its life, you need to wrap it with tree wrap. And then I've even started putting tree guards. I wrap it and then put guards because I've had rabbits eat through the wrap. So tree wrap and tree guards are not the same thing, but it is ideal to use both on young trees for the first three to four years, especially if you live out in the country where rabbits and deer and critters might be more of a problem than in town. But we know in town, rabbits uh, are also a problem uh, for these trees. So but wrap your trees not only for the critters, but for the southwest injury. The southwest injury is damaging and the tree wrap helps prevent that. Okay, so we'll take some questions now, if anybody has any. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. I just want to give one quick comment. If you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself, or if you were more comfortable, submit that in the chat. Um, but Jennifer, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, someone who doesn't garden that very much, um, it's really eye-opening and good to know that it might not necessarily be me killing my plants. Yeah, well, thanks for having me today. I hope you guys are kind of able to see some of the things that are going around the region or are things that we have seen in the past that, that may continue to happen in the future. So hopefully it was beneficial to everyone. All righty. If there aren't any other questions, I do have one for you, Jennifer. Um, if after this call, one of our participants uh, has a question that they've come home to their garden and realized there's something wrong, how can someone get in contact with you or one of your colleagues around the state? Yeah, if you're from the Northeast region, you can contact me at the Adair County Extension Center. You can call the Adair County Extension Center's number at 660-665-9866. Or you can uh, go to our website, Adair County Extension. Uh, you can like us on Facebook and go to our Facebook page, MU Extension in Adair County. So there are some different ways where you can find me. Um, I get a lot of calls. Uh, I get a lot of email. Uh, it is easiest to identify your problems by email. If you will send me an email and attach photos. Um, if you call, we, I can give you my email address. Um, but I would be glad to answer your question. But know that if you're wanting me to identify a problem or identify a plant for you, I need a photo. Or if you're in Kirksville, you can stop by the office with your, with your sample and I'd be glad to, uh, to help you out. But in all of our counties, there, there, there is somebody that covers, there's a horticulture specialist that is assigned to the different counties. Mm -hmm. So just know that you can, you can go to your county office and somebody at the county office will direct you to the horticulture specialist serving your county if they're not located in that particular county. Well, I do not see any questions in the chat. It is 102, so I just wanna say thank you again, Jennifer. This was very informative. Formative. And thank you everyone who participated today. I hope you were able to learn something and have a great weekend.